Good morning everyone and uh, isn't it great when um, we just come together and share the peace of God with one another it's, it moves something in us I have a friend of mine called Matt Clark and uh, he's actually a tornado pilot he flies you know the fast fighter jets and I was talking to him one day and I said what, what's the most important thing when you're flying this fast fighter jet when you're going at twice the speed of sound and he said it's remembering the whole team that are behind me it takes 40 odd people to keep him in the air from the person that blows up the tyres he said to the person that makes his meal to the person that, that knits that, that sews the flight suit and everything he would be nowhere if it wasn't for the support of all the other, all the other team members and I feel a bit like Matt Clark this morning because I'm delivering the word of God I'm hoping it's going to sort of fly straight and true but all your prayers and all your ministry to me and all your worship of God have put me in the position of being able to fly straight and true with the word of God. So, thank you for that. Um, now, normally, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the, uh, the first thing you're taught to do when, when you stand up and speak is to regale people with a, a funny story or a nice little anecdote. Well, you've had my funny stories you um, heard the last one I think it was the talcum powder incident <laughs> for those of you who don't know about it it's, <laughs> it's not as bad as it sounds but, so I haven't got a story like the talcum powder incident this time but I have and I was talking to Mike earlier on and sometimes talking about the Beatitudes it's not easy you have to really get into the word of God you really have to sort of sort out things in your own life to begin to be able to, to speak the very words that Jesus spoke it isn't Paul's interpretation it isn't Peter's interpretation it isn't John's interpretation it's the very words that Jesus spoke himself so I'm charged with a great responsibility this morning and so Lord I'm inviting you to come and to minister beyond my words and I, I'd started putting this together about a week or so ago. Can you hear me, by the way? Okay. Right. And, uh, you know, you get to the point where you think, yeah, that looks okay, but it still, it still hasn't got exactly what I'm looking to say. So I, I sort of sat down and I thought and I thought, and nothing was coming to me any more than what I'd already written down. So I thought, well, it's Saturday. I'll really get down to, to looking at this. So I went to Sheffield <coughs> Meadow Hall on the train yes now it was interesting I thought maybe I'll see something maybe I'll hear something we were, there. were you? oh we're in Sheffield well I was uh, I was in Sheffield as well um, I was in there in the afternoon and I went on the train and I thought maybe I'll see something or hear something that'll, that'll just get me right into what I want to say and nothing nothing at all I was looking in the shops and there was and so I came back on the train a little bit disappointed and I thought, well, maybe I'll see something when I get back to Leeds. Well, there were the old Leeds United supporters and Millwall supporters shouting at each other in the station, which was interesting. <laughs> and then I saw off the 1852 from Castleford, there were four people got off. One was dressed as Darth Vader. <laughs> One was dressed as the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> And, and, and so one was dressed as a mummy and the other one was dressed as Spider-Man I thought well maybe I can get something about how even though we're all so different God can bring us together <laughs> but I thought no that's too trite so I thought I'll just have to stick with, with what I've written down so I decided I had about 45 minutes to wait for the bus so I went and got a cup of coffee at McDonald's and a hot apple pie and I, I, I took one great swig of the coffee and I suddenly realised they hadn't given me coffee at all. What they'd given me was white hot molten lava <laughs> from the bowels of the earth. <laughs> probably through Mount Vesuvius. You could hear the screams above the tannoy in the station. And I suddenly realised I'd forgotten what it actually says on the cup. Caution. Contents may be hot. And they were white hot. It was so hot, it was cold till it got hot. You see what I mean? And, and so I thought, that just shows me something. I've done it before. 
I did it with hot apple pie from McDonald's once. And, and I've done it with um, a Cornish pasty from Greg's. You take one bite and suddenly you realise it's red hot inside. Caution. Contents may be hot. Sometimes what seems to comfort you, seems as though it's going to be good for you, really comes back and bites you. It can scold your trusting tongue. The Beatitudes are like that. They can sneak up on you and bite. Caution. Contents may be hot. The words we often quote, we quote them in a nice, comfortable way. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They're comfortable words. They make us feel good about ourselves. And sometimes they can become a bit bland and a bit soft. That was far from Jesus' intention. The news that the poor and the persecuted are not only blessed, but will gain the kingdom of God, that's hot. That's very hot. The Beatitudes are as much a hard political statement to those that ignore the plight of the oppressed and needy, as much as they are comfort and promised to those that are persecuted and downtrodden. Caution. Contents may be hot. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's the text I've been given for today. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's the goal of the Christian life, isn't it? It's what being a Christian is all about. It's an amazing statement. We can live life in such a way that we can see God how amazing uh, how many times have we seen God I can't say that I have but Moses did Abraham did and in, in times gone by the, the, the temple in which God was worshipped was enveloped in what was known as the, the Shekinah the glory of God the brightness of God the fire of God that's the promise we have we can see God blessed well we've already had great speakers who've been here in the last few weeks there's Mike John Pete Pat and if I've missed anyone out I'm sorry I was listening I promise they've spoken to us and, and some of them have told us what blessed means so I don't need to go into that it's already been explained Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I think this beatitude is the most central and most significant of the beatitudes. You can't be poor in spirit without being pure in heart. You can't mourn over things that grieve or displease God without being pure in heart. Neither can you be meek or hunger and thirst after righteousness or be prepared to stand persecution for the name of Christ without having a pure heart. In fact, what Jesus is talking about here on this Sermon on the Mount, in this Beatitude, is one of the most central pr principles of the Christian life. It's a principle that echoes through the Old Testament as well as the New. Here's a saying. And it's not one I've, uh, I've made up, it's one that I read. But I think, it's, I think it's great. In all of God's dealings with humans, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. So let's have a look at uh, what we actually meant, what we actually mean by having a pure heart. I don't know if, if, um, if any of you uh, are like me. Sometimes we, we, we have a, a vocabulary amongst Christians that we accept and we think we understand, but we don't really. I remember when I first became a Christian, about three days after I'd been a Christian, somebody came up and said, Tell us your testimony, brother. Give us your testimony. What, what, I have, what's the testimony? We all have an idea that we know what testimony means. We do now, if we've been walking with, with, with God for a long time, if we've been in Christianity for a long time, we know what a testimony it is. It's testifying about who Jesus Christ is and what he's become and what he means in your life, 
and what he's done and what he will do and how he'll minister to you that's the testimony it's talking about Jesus but I didn't know what testimony meant and I'm not sure we sometimes fully understand what's meant by heart here so how are you for a little bit of a Hebrew and a Greek lesson oh good (laughs) because you might be able to help me there's two questions raised by um, having a pure heart can we ever have a pure heart and what do we mean by heart well it's it, heart what is it it's an organ inside our chest it pumps blood it's made of tissue and muscle its purpose is to pump blood around the body so the, to the lungs for oxygen to the brain to keep it alive to other organs I mean, yeah, to the brain to keep it alive I wonder if it's doing such a good job with me sometimes It's to supply the other organs with the oxygen that it needs, that they need for them to do their vital job. And uh, I'm no cardiologist, so that's about my sum total knowledge of what the heart does. It's something inside there that goes thump, 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 and, and does something that keeps me alive. So what's on earth a pump, a muscle, got to do with pleasing or displeasing God? And I'm going to do something I don't often do. I'm going to quote uh, from a book here by a chap called... I've got a lovely... Don't, don't, don't some people write books have wonderful names? H. Wheeler Robinson. H. Wheeler Robinson wrote a book called The Christian Doctrine of Man. And he describes in The Christian Doctrine of Man five classes of meanings to be found in the Bible to do with the heart now I'm not saying I agree with all these classes but this is what he says A. A body organ 29 references B. Character, personality and inner life 257 references C. Psychical states of consciousness whatever that means 166 references D. Intellectual activities 204 references E will or purpose 195 references what can we say from this it's complex it's not easy to understand we don't know whether Jesus when he was speaking the words of the Beatitudes was was using Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek all were in use at the time and many scholars believe Jesus spoke Aramaic he probably did but he was probably perfectly capable of speaking Greek and Hebrew as well. And um, in Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ, the the Romans are shown as speaking Latin. They may have done, but it's more likely they spoke Greek because that was in the Eastern Empire, was the language that was spoken rather than Latin. So you see, Jesus, what I'm trying to say here is Jesus was able to communicate with people on whatever level they were you don't see him having to have a translator to speak to the Roman authorities you don't see him having to have a translator to speak to the Jewish authorities you don't see him having to have a translator to speak to the common people as you might call them so I'm sure that he was able to speak in all three of those languages we're just going to look at Greek and Hebrew you might be interested to know it's all about finding out what's meant by the heart the Hebrew for pure heart is bar chlebar. I'll say that one again because I didn't say it quite right. Bar chlebar. <laughs> the translation into Greek is kathoris de cardia. So you can see where we get cardiologists from. Cardia is the Greek word for heart. Cardiologist, a heart specialist. Bar in the Hebrew is an adjective, a describing word, which is rela- related to the verb bara which means to purify to purge or to cleanse so what's it doing here what is this first word bar referring to here it's describing an object which can be purified even if it's impure it can be purified even if in and of itself it's impure chleba is interesting it means heart or understanding it actually means heart or understanding 
So in Hebrew, the word heart in this context is closer to the idea of mind rather than soul or spirit. Sometimes we tend to use all these words interchangeably. I'm just trying to draw out what's meant by heart in this case. They, the soul and the spirit will be identified by the use of the Hebrew words nefesh and ruach which are related to breath and wind. They're to do with something that's, that's moving, that's, that's physical. That's but the heart here is something different. Heart in Hebrew is then not used as some Christians have interpreted it as synonymous with soul or spirit. The best meaning is the self of an individual. It's to do with the self that I have inside me. The inner man, I think, might be a description that's used in other parts of the New Testament, the inner person. So the self has will and volition and purpose. It can choose and make decisions. So bar chlebar is a heart which can be purified. And that's stated in 1 John verse... Uh, sorry, 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. When Jesus was speaking of the pure in heart, he was indicating individuals who have chosen to pursue a, poor, a pure self. I'm having trouble with my words this morning. Have you noticed? <laughs> so, we can choose to have a pure heart. Well and good. But I'm sure somebody will shout out now, but aren't we all sinners? No? Okay. I'll shout it out for you. But are we not all sinners? Does the Bible not tell us that we're corrupt and lost in the darkness of our sin? It does. It tells us that all over the place. How many have heard of Martin Luther? Oh, just about everyone. Okay, Martin Luther, as you know, was a great reformer when the Catholic Church was in crisis and secularism had entered into it and all sorts of trouble and strife were going on, Martin Luther spoke about the idea of, of, of not hearing the words of Jesus through a priest or uh, from the Pope, but through Scripture, sola scriptura. His fight with the Catholic Church was to say we all are able to read or should be able to read and understand scripture for ourselves but even Martin Luther said of himself and it's hardly politically correct in these days but he said this I am more afraid of my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals I have within me the great Pope by which he meant that you know his heart was corrupt even though he was fighting this, this fantastic fabulous fight to bring scripture to everyone he, he knew his own heart was impure the apostle Paul in Romans 7 talks of the war raging within himself how the good he wanted to do he didn't do, he couldn't do and the evil he didn't want to do he did do quite easily Jesus said that out of the heart comes evil thoughts murders, adulteries fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. That's in Matthew 15, verses 17 to 19. It's not a rosy picture. It's not, um, not as though in here it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, neutral. Our hearts, as Jeremiah says, are deceitful, corrupt, and desperately wicked. And we're told that God doesn't look on the outward appearance, but at the heart. You find that in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. <laughs> what chance have we got then? In and of ourselves, none. Zilch. Can't do it. Not possible. It is impossible for our hearts to be clean. But, even in the Old Testament, there were glimmers of hope, there were glimmers of understanding. Psalm 119 verse 9 How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word is his own answer. And in verse 11 of that same psalm 
I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And God himself promises through Jeremiah who has to- just told us how deceitful and corrupt the heart is. He promises through Jeremiah I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. We're told that the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. That's 1 Chronicles 28 verse 9. And David, David, after the sin that he'd committed sending Uriah to be killed because of his dalliance with Bathsheba, David's dalliance, that is not Uriah's, David cries out after the terrible sin has been exposed. Creating me a clean heart, there's hope. It's not all black. It's not all darkness. It's not all negative. There is tremendous hope. Creating me a clean heart. So here's the good news for all of us who are Christians. We are a new creation. By believing in and accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, He makes us a new creation. And get this, gives us a new heart. That's in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 if you want to look it up. But it's not enough. It's not enough that it's a one-off. We know that when we become Christians we're made a new creation. We're given a, a new heart. That's fantastic. So now we can live as we like, can't we? Can't we? No. Paul said, when wrestling with some people who were exactly choosing that view, and I always think of uh, Peter Fennig when I, when I read this one out. Peter Fennig is, is a, a lovely chap, and um, he's spoken to this church on occasions before, and uh, he loves to speak on Paul. And what what Paul says here is, Shall I sin the more, that grace may abound the more? And this is what Peter Fenwick said, By no means, by no means, shall we sin more and more and more, so that we can get more and more of the grace. That's not the way it works. By no means. We must maintain the purity of heart that's been bought for us at great cost. Who bought it for us? Jesus did on the cross Jesus is the only one who's holy enough Jesus is the only one who is without sin Jesus is the only one who went to the cross and shed his blood and brought us back he if we believe the scripture when we accept him comes to live within us by his Holy Spirit and cleanse us and keep us clean So how can we maintain this purity of heart? Firstly, by spending time in the Word of God. Isn't it simple? Spending time in the Word of God. And I don't just mean this wonderful book here. I mean by spending time in the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who am I talking about? Jesus by spending time with Jesus and reading in the written word about Jesus and about what God wants of us. Doing that helps to clean us straight away. Just by simply opening this book, it helps to clean us. It helps to clean our hearts. It focuses our minds upon what's good and pure and holy. His Spirit lives within us. And if we're close to him, we will realise that check in our spirit when we're about to launch along a selfish route. I'm sure we've all experienced that, haven't we? You're about to start to do something and, and then you have this discussion. There's a check, there's something that's just, mm, not sure. Now, at that point, you can choose. We're not robots, we're given choice. But living close to the Holy Spirit enables us to hear that voice more and more clearly. I wish I heard it clear, more clearly. Each day I know there are things in me that are not pure. And I'm sure if we're honest with ourselves we all recognise that. 
but living close to Jesus exposes that and enables us and gives us the wherewithal to deal with that we can't do it of ourselves but we can with Jesus what's another way well it's fellowship didn't you feel good just sort of saying good morning the peace of the Lord with you giving someone just a hug just a few moments ago fellowship with other Christians fellowship with the people of the way the way of Christ it helps to be accountable to one another Hebrews 10 verse 24 exhorts us let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds I'll read that again because it's so important let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds Uh, we're called to do that we're called to be accountable to each other and to spur one another on a third way is to train our hearts for purity by doing the works of God that's the very thing that we're called to do do the works of God the word of God and the works of God Um, I always remember um, John Wimber he was talking in a different context he was talking about how do you 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 deal with with certain um, spiritual things it is not any good for me to to sit in my armchair and say the words I iron you shirt (laughs) I iron you shirt I iron you shirt no it's the word and the work I'm going to iron that shirt now I have to get up plug it in and iron the shirt the word and the works of God so good deeds the works of God these are the things that are called for in Beatitudes such as as the one about peacemaking and being gentle and caring for and fighting on behalf of the oppressed and blessing one another just a word of blessing can sometimes make a person's day can change their whole outlook I want to quote from a a friend of mine I actually sent out one or two email messages to to friends of mine I do have some uh, asking what's your idea of purity what do you think this beatitude means and this is one that was sent from a lady I know and she suffers an awful lot from pain she has chronic pain and in fact is going into hospital to a pain clinic to, to, to see if they can do something about that but this is what she said purity is a life poured out for Jesus a life that is always in tune with the beat of the Father's heart a life so selfless that it seeks to touch, to love, to encourage, to nurture I can't read my own writing here anyway something to share the love and fragrance of Jesus at all times especially when you feel there is nothing left to give or even offer then it is a life of love at its most precious and profound because it is devoid of self a living sacrifice for the Godhead this brings with it hidden treasures and rewards from Father's throne and is a sweet savour to his nostrils exceeding joy and glory too now she said it far better than I can and she actually said what John was saying earlier on that it's about how we can please God how we can be in collaboration with God how because he is holy he wants to impart that holiness to us and because he knows that we're unable to be that of ourselves Jesus and the Holy Spirit guide us and help us to be holy it's, it's a winnable battle but it is a battle purity of heart can be instant and progressive and you can see that in Revelation 2 verses 1 to 5 where Jesus is talking in this case not to individuals but to, but to a church like ours and saying when you became when you first understood me you became pure 
But now you've lost that a little bit. I want you to work at being pure. I want you to work at being holy. It's doable. It's doable because we have the, the great helper to help us. And what's the reward? We shall see God. Ooh. <laughs> Now, uh, you could do a whole ten weeks of sermons on We Shall See God. So this is, this is very poor, but it's my, my um, quick skim of what it means to see God. Many times we're told that God is too holy to be seen. And uh, that's true. You see it plenty of times in the Old Testament. Nobody can see God and live. I think, I think there's only one or two that ever did Moses was one Adam was one the normal evangelical interpretation of, of, of we shall see God is that we shall see God in his creation the stars the world in a child through others acting in grace and that's all true but even a non-believer can experience the awesomeness of creation I have, I have friends who, who have no concept or belief in God whatsoever, yet they're fascinated by looking at the stars. They're, they're smitten when they look at the beauty of, of uh, what I call creation. So it's built into us, that aspect of seeing God. Even if you, can't, if you have no knowledge of God, you can still see God in the works of his creation. I think the best uh, way of, of saying it is that in Christ we see God. We see him in his activities in and amongst us. If we pray for healing and healing is forthcoming, we have seen God. But that's, that's still not quite it, is it? It's still not quite what I think is meant by seeing God. I think there is the potential for us to see God in his glory. Isaiah managed it. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he was high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And the angels around cried, Holy, holy, holy. And what was Isaiah's response? I'm a man of unclean lips. What was God's response? To send a burning coal to touch his lips. We can see God in just the same way Isaiah did we can know that burning coal brought to us because that's the holiness of God. And I do believe that, that there will come a time when we will see God face to face. And that's awesome. I don't even know how to begin to describe that. But hey, it's what Jesus said. It's what Jesus said. We shall see God. Um, can't argue with Jesus really. So Jesus has brought back that relationship that was lost by Adam. So let's aim for purity and holiness. And I think my time is just about finished, so we're going to finish on Colossians 4 verse 8. And if I can read my writing this time. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. My paraphrase of that, in doing so, you will purify your heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen.